Business was exempt from it, and Justice Thomas would have none of that. And Pope Francis yesterday issuing a letter to the Christians of the Holy Land in preparation for Good Friday, expressing his solidarity with a community that continues to suffer amid the ongoing Israeli Hamas war. For more news with a Catholic perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tomio, and call to communion with Dr. David Anders starts now. What's stopping you, you, you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? one 288 ewtn I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. one 288 3986 What's stopping Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? you, you. This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, a very holy Thursday to you. Welcome again to EWTN's Call to Communion, and uh, this is the program. You may have heard about it. It is a program on a Catholic radio network for non-Catholics. What is that all about? Well, if you've got a question about the Catholic faith, maybe you personally are not a Catholic, but you really want to get the question answered that has been on your mind, we can help you out with that. Here's our phone number, 833 833- 288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're listening to us in Uganda, please dial 1 and then 205-271-2985. And of course, you can always send us an email 24-7. CTC at EWTN.com is the address. CTC at EWTN.com. Charles Beery is our producer. Matt Kabinsky is our phone screener. Rich Jesse normally handles social media for us, but I believe Ace is handling that today. So all you have to do if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, if you've got a question, put your co- your question in the comments box. If you would, please, Ace will see that. He'll shoot it to us here in the studio, and hopefully we can answer your question on today's program. Again, the phone number 833-288-EWTN. I'm Tom Price along with... Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Very well. How are you, my friend? Oh, I'm doing decent. Thank you. We've got a great question that came in overnight on the EWTN listeners' comment line. Hello, my name is Janine. I'm calling from Toronto. And my question is, how do all the Protestant religions consider themselves all the religion when they weren't founded until like 1550, 1650, 1750, 1850? How can they consider themselves the true religion? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So it really depends on which Protestants you ask. It depends on which Protestants you ask. And the answer to that question has changed over the centuries. So if you were to go back to the 16th century, for example, which is the dates you were identifying as the foundations of many of these denominations, the way that Protestants back then thought of themselves was they, especially John uh, Calvin and Martin Luther, they would not have conceived of themselves as establishing a new church. In fact, they were adamant that they weren't. They're, in their in their ideas was that they were part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and they were just purifying it of corruptions that the Pope had brought in through the Middle Ages. So that was how they justified it. They still had the idea of one holy Catholic and apostolic, but uh, but they were going to purify its various uh, its various corruptions that had that had creeped in. Now, the problem was that that idea, which was common, was shared by many of the reformers. They had different ideas about what purifying the church looked like. And so very early on, you began to have splits in the Protestant movement, the, the beginnings of what we now think of as denominationalism. And initially, they anathematized one another, right? They, they thought, well, no, my version of the reform is the right one. No, my version of the reform is the right one. And, uh, and they just kept multiplying till there were more and more and more of them. And so a different ideology emerged, emerged in the 18th century, and it was this idea of, um, well, you know, the different denominations are like different flavors of ice cream. You know, they're, they, they, really, uh, they, they really don't matter that much. What matters is that we agree on the essentials, and at least in the 18th century, that meant the essentials of the new birth, uh, regeneration, faith in Christ, conversion, and that one identifies the quote-unquote true church because of one's adherence to that true faith and that experience of conversion in one's heart. So the idea of things like historical continuity become less important to them because they have a more interior conception of what it means to be the church. So um, that's, uh, yeah, like I said, the, the answer to that question has, has differed. Now, the, the Catholic position is that the church, 
uh, is a visible body. It is a visible society founded by Jesus with an actual constitution, forms of government, confession of faith, sacramental life, etc., and that we can look for historical continuity down through the ages. And that's the view I would hold that we find in sacred scripture, and it's been constant in Christianity for 2,000 years. All right, very good. And thank you so much uh, for your question. Here's one now from Marcus listening to us in Malta in the Mediterranean. Marcus says, and this is very timely, I know we have the Paschal Sacred Triduum. Is that all one big, gigantic holy day of obligation? He's referring to Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. Uh, and does Easter Sunday of the Lord's resurrection suffice? Could you please clarify? That's for Marcus and Malta. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> so there's a kind of a two-part answer to your question. Interestingly, in the mind of the church, even though the Triduum takes place over three days, it's seen as one liturgical celebration. It's one big, long liturgical fest because uh-huh. we're really we're really commemorating the the the, the culmination of Christ's life, his his passion, death, and resurrection, all one big thing. Um, but in terms of when do you actually have to be in the church? You have to be there for the Easter liturgy, right? So you don't have to go say tonight. You don't have to go on Holy Thursday. You don't have to go on Good Friday. I mean, I'd recommend it. Yeah, right? yeah. But you do have to be there on Easter. All right, very good. And this one uh, from Julie. My question is in regard to a Holy Thursday Mass at our local Catholic parish, which includes parish, which includes a liturgical dance. I have read that the Vatican does not approve of this type of thing. However, some more liberal Catholic churches permit it, and I was told that our bishop has approved. My friend, who belongs to this parish and has been to this liturgical dance Mass in the past, says it's extremely holy. Uh, any thoughts on this that could help me decide whether or not to attend tonight? Thanks, Julie. Look, I, I'm just going to give you my own personal point of view here, and that is that I'm going to stick with the liturgy as it is prescribed by the church. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to go to a mass where they, where they, um, uh, where they say what they're supposed to say and do what they're supposed to do, and they don't add stuff that's not in the rubrics of the mass. That's that's my own that's my own uh, personal position. Now, you know, in terms of you know, what your bishop has allowed, he's your bishop, and so I'm not going to speak against anything that your bishop has said, but personally, I'm going to go to the Mass as it conforms to the typical edition published by the Vatican and promulgated throughout the Church Universal. Well, there you go. A couple of very timely questions here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Julie, thank you so much. We hope that's helpful for you. Also, thanks to uh, Marcus in Malta, somewhere there in the Mediterranean. Always good to hear from uh, Far away places here on EWTN's Call to Communion. In a moment, we're going to be talking with Joseph in Las Vegas, also Paul in Kentucky, one line being screened right now, and three lines open for you. This is a great time to get your question in so you don't have to wait till after Easter to get your answer. 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Call to communion with Dr. David Anders on this Holy Thursday of Holy Week here on EWTN. This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, president of Life Issues Institute. Both CVS and Walgreens pharmacies have agreed to sell the dangerous chemical abortion pill, If women are picking up this deadly drug at the pharmacy, they're likely going home to abort their babies on their own. Evidence suggests women aren't informed of what's in store and that they'll likely see their dead baby. At the time the FDA approved chemical abortion pills, the prevailing research emphatically required multiple in-person visits at a doctor's office, and they strongly cautioned against a non-medical environment for dispensing chemical abortion pills. These major pharmacies are now part of the abortion industry. My advice to you is find a local independent pharmacy. You get better service and won't have to partner with pharmaceutical abortionists. Follow us on social media at Life Issues Institute. Hi, this is Father Mike Schmitz. Please join me for Ascension's Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year here on EWTN Radio. We're going through the entire Bible and the Catechism in 365 days. If you've ever wanted to understand what it means to be Catholic and allow those truths to shape your life, this is for you. 
Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on EWTN Radio. It's called the Communion here on EWTN. Sold out phones at the moment. Uh, however, when a line becomes available, you're invited to give us a call at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Let me be very serious for just a moment here. You know, for over 40 years, EWTN has been praying with and for people all over the world. And today, we want to pray for anything that weighs on your heart, such as family members, health, finances. It is our honor to pray for you, and we take this very seriously. Please take a moment now and send us your prayer request. Here's where you can send it, ewtn.com slash prayer, ewtn.com slash prayer. Thank you so much. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. And we'll begin here with Joseph in Las Vegas listening on YouTube this afternoon. A blessed Holy Week to you, Joseph. What's on your mind today, sir? Hey, Tom and Dr. Anders. It's always good to hear from you. Happy Holy Thursday to you. And as we say in our Maronite tradition, the happy feast of the Corbono. Ah. Um, so my question for, for Dr. David Anders and for, well, Tom, both of you, is a little bit, what is the difference between Catholicism and Orthodoxy when it comes to how we perceive Christ's humanity and, div uh, humanity and divinity, and I'll explain a little bit further what I mean. So, like, how did the Catholic Church view how Christ viewed his passion? Like, did he know he was going to die at 3 o'clock, and how he was going to— um, um, did he know at the time he was going to be arrested, for instance? And, like, how do Catholics, Orthodox, per se, Protestants view that? And then a quick side note I was actually going to say before you answer that question was, you know, you think about all the division that happened between those two churches. I think it's also kind of ridiculous that the Orthodox are celebrating the Paschal Triduum on May 3rd rather, you know, than a little bit closer to Passover. That, that's my question. Thank you so much, guys. It's okay, really yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Joseph. So um, the question of asking us to contrast Catholic and Orthodox views of the passion of Christ or how Jesus understood his passion is complicated by the fact that the, most of the theological patrimony of orthodoxy, uh, particularly among the fathers, is also claimed as common ground by the Catholic Church. And so you can talk about, say, Greek versus Latin theories of the atonement, um, but that doesn't track with Catholic versus Orthodox because, you see, the Greek fathers are also Catholic, like from our point of view, from the point of view of the Catholic Church, the Cappadocians and Maximus and, and Athanasius, Chrysostom. These are Catholic doctors of the Church, and so they're every bit as much a part of the Catholic patrimony as they are the Orthodox patrimony. And so, you know, when you talk about the death of Christ, theologians talk about models of the atonement, ways of understanding what happened on the cross and how it benefited us. And there are some there are some normative concepts that we have as Catholics. I mean, one, I think the principal normative concept is clearly enunciated in sacred scripture and as well as it's uh, explicit in the liturgy is the idea of the death of Christ as a sacrifice. But and so you 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 can't you can't get away from that. I mean, the book of Hebrews is all about the sacrificial character of Jesus' death. But above and beyond the image of sacrifice, there are a lot of other images that scripture and tradition uh, evoke regarding the death of Christ. So a, a very preeminent one is the idea of Christ's death as an example. I mean, the Scripture explicitly teaches that Christ's death is an example that we should follow. Um, in the book of Acts, in the book of Luke, Christ's death mm -hmm. is an occasion to evoke contrition and repentance for those responsible for putting him to, him to death. That, that's that's yet another way of conceiving about the death of Christ. So, for example, in Jesus I mean, uh, Peter's sermon at Pentecost, uh, he says, uh, "You know, you you guys killed the holy and righteous one. You put him to death, and but God vindicated him by raising him from the dead." And the people hear that and they go, "They're cut to the heart." And their yeah. response is, "Oh my gosh, what have we done? What do we need to do?" And Peter says, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission mm -hmm. of your sins." So, you have the idea of the death of Christ as a kind of a, a kind of um, an occasion for someone to come to confront their own guilt uh, and their own responsibility for the death of a 
for the unjust death of a righteous person. Like mm. I'm, I am convicted of, in some, I'm implicated in somebody else's martyrdom, basically. Right. Yeah. That's another way of conceiving. And so it has a moral effect on me to bring me to contrition. Um, uh, there's a model of the atonement that's very common in Orthodoxy, but is also present in the Catholic tradition, which is the idea of Christ's death as a defeat of the powers, the powers of evil, the powers of sin, death, hell, and the devil. And, uh, you know, Christ speaks about, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, right? This, this, uh, his, uh, his confrontation with the demons as, uh, as the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, um, his descent to the realm of the dead and his ascension, as the harrowing of hell, the opening up of, of uh, the realm of the dead, so that the righteous of the old covenant can be liberated and uh, and and and, uh, and ascend to heaven with him. That's yet a different model of the atonement. And again, you find all of these in uh, in Catholicism and in Orthodoxy. So so I, I to me it's a bit. I have I've read Orthodox polemics that try to draw this radical contrast between Orthodox and Catholic doctrines of the atonement. Really, it seems to me what they're doing is they're drawing a contrast between Greek and Latin theologies of the atonement, forgetting that Catholics also incorporate into their self-understanding the Greek, the Hellenistic, uh, the Cappadocian, etc. Um, now, when it comes to Christ's own self-understanding, here I think I think Orthodox and Catholics are of one mind, um, especially those Orthodox that uh, hold to the Council of Chalcedon. We both affirm the complete divinity and humanity of Jesus, and so that what can be predicated of one nature can be predicated of the other in the person. So Christ, uh, so God is omniscient, and so the person of Christ is omniscient. And so, of course, he, he knows and anticipates his own death perfectly and understands it to be for the redemption of the world. All right. Joseph, we hope that's helpful for you. Thanks so much for your call today. That opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. Very busy phones today, so call now, 833-288-3986. Call to communion here on EWTN. Uh, Lania is watching us on YouTube this afternoon in uh, Nebraska. Here's uh, her question. She says that, Dr. Anders, my friend in another diocese said she is going to be washing feet tonight. I thought only the priest could do that. Your thoughts? Okay, here are my thoughts, and this kind of covers all liturgy questions in one fell swoop. Okay. My view, which I think I've made clear, is that the Church has promulgated a a typical edition of the Latin rite of the Mass. Yep. Typical means like the one that is the type from which all of our particular celebrations are drawn. That's a technical term. Um, she has published a book of instructions, the, uh, the, um, the, the general instruction on the Roman Missal, explaining how to do the thing. My view is we should do what the Church says. That's my view, right? We should say the words that the Church tells us to say. We should perform the gestures that the Church tells us to perform, that the persons indicated in the rubrics who are to perform the gestures should perform the gestures, and we should not go inventing a bunch of stuff, right, that is not found in the, in the rubrics or the liturgy that the Church has promulgated. And there are a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that the Church is smarter than I am, and, uh, and it knows what it's about, and it promulgates the liturgy in the shape and form that it does for my edification, and it's going to do a better job of it than I am. But another reason is that the reason you have liturgy, one of the reasons you have liturgy, is so that the people of God can become accustomed to the prayers that, and the forms, that they can become natural or second nature to you, and so that you can really enter into them uh, with your whole heart, mind, and soul. When when you have liturgical innovators, the congregation, rather than being able to give themselves up to the liturgy and, and to really abandon themselves to what they know is deeply edifying, they, uh, they are, as it were, on the edge of their seat waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I have been in masses like this where, where the celebrant thinks that it's cute to insert a bunch of stuff that's not actually in the text. And, and I don't know why they think this is edifying, what what typically happens is as soon as they deviate from the language of the Mass, you go, oh no, where are they going to go next? Yeah. What kind of horrible thing is going to come? And even if they don't veer into outright heresy, like the fear is always there in the back of your mind. What is this guy getting ready to say? And now so what? now instead of paying attention to the passion of the Christ and the resurrection of our Lord and his edifying and life-giving teaching, what am I paying attention to? I'm paying attention to my own anxiety about what this nincompoop is going to pull out of his head. Right. And 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 I and the Nickham being the celebrant sure. who's decided to depart from what the church has said. Right. Yeah. And uh, and so I don't know the form. I don't know what's coming. There isn't any kind of specified normative pattern for this because he's winging it. He's improvising and he's disobeying the church and doing it. And it's totally distracting to the lay people. It's not edifying. It's not cute. It's not funny. Um, and uh, 
I think I'm making my point clear. Well, I <laughs> think know? so. I mean, yeah. it's just I don't see any. If you if you want like you know free form loosey goosey liturgy, like go to a charismatic prayer meeting. Like that's what that's for. If you want to improvise, if you want to innovate, if you want to be moved by the Spirit, there are places in the Catholic Church where you're allowed to do that to give sort of free reign and expression to your own intuitions. And and you know we can evaluate one another's contributions in that context, but there's a place for that, right? Or in your own private prayer life. But in the public liturgy of the church, please, folks, let's just stick to what the church has given us. There you go. Lania, thanks so much for watching us on YouTube this afternoon. Paul is in northern Kentucky listening on the great Sacred Heart Radio. A blessed Holy Week to you, Paul. What's on your mind today, sir? You too. Um, first one, say I enjoyed the show a lot. I've learned so much from this show. Thank you. My very simple question is, what do we mean by, I've always been confused by the word begotten. What do we mean when we say, you know, Christ was begotten of God? Yeah, yeah, sure, thanks, appreciate it. So, obviously, from a biological point of view, to beget is the nature of the relationship that a father has to the conception of his child. We talk about, you know, the mother conceives, the father begets. That's what the word means, okay. biologically. Now, obviously, when we're talking about the relationship of Jesus, the Son of God, to God the Father, we're not talking about a biological <laughs> begetting. Um, uh, and so the, 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 the scriptures and the fathers of the church are striving, they're kind, of, they're kind of stretching out to find a vocabulary to describe the nature of the relationship of the Father to Son. Now, one thing that we know it is not, the Son is not related to the Father as a creature to the Creator. He is not. He's not related in that way. God is not the Creator of the Son. The Son has always existed. There's no time when He was not. There's a heresy in ancient Christianity called Arianism, that did think that God created the second person, that the second person is a creature with a beginning in time. And the church father said, no, 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 no. There was no time when Christ did not exist, when the second person did not exist. Uh, he's not a creature. He was not made. What word can we find? I know we'll, we'll take one that's a metaphor from the language of biology and say mm. he was begotten, not made. Uh -huh. And so in the creed, when we confess the nature of Christ, we say, begotten, not made. Now, here is the trick when you apply it to the second person of the Trinity. When, when I beget a son, it is a moment in time. But when God begets, it's an eternal begetting. So there is a filial paternal relationship between father and the son. So the word begetting is an appropriate metaphor there. But where it differs from the human begetting is this is a begetting that has no beginning. It is the beginningless begetting. It is the eternal begetting. And again, it's a, it's, a, it's a figurative way of expressing a relationship of origin and procession that is eternal. Okay. Thanks so much uh, for your question. Appreciate that. Hearing from you, uh, Paul, in northern Kentucky. Darren's watching us on YouTube this afternoon. Darren says, I will be attending a Good Friday service tomorrow. I am not Catholic. During communion, should I remain in the pew, or can I get in line with my arms crossed and approach the priest? Okay, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So in, in, in virtually every Catholic church, uh, if you approach, if you get in the communion line and cross your arms across your chest, the priest will offer you a blessing and not distribute Holy Communion to you, and you will not be seen to be doing anything untoward. And, and if there's a lot of people jumping in line there with doing that, and you want to do that, I, I won't speak against it. I will say it's unnecessary, right? It's unnecessary. And the reason it's unnecessary is because the priest blesses everyone in the congregation at yeah. the conclusion of the service. And so if you're interested in receiving a priestly blessing, you got to get one regardless. And there's nothing particularly special about getting it at the end of a line. Um, but, I mean, if you want to, I'm, I, won't, I won't speak against it. It's fairly common practice in the church. Very good. And here's kind of a tough one from Jeff in Ontario. Dr. Andrews, is it true that if a priest heard the confession of sexual abuse of children, he will not have to report it? This is disturbing. It's keeping my Anglican wife away from the Catholic Church. Thanks, Jeff in Ontario. Yeah, it's a really very good thing that the Church insists absolutely without qualification on the seal of the confession. And so no matter what you confess in the confessional, 
uh, the priest uh, uh, the priest cannot, under pain of excommunication, reveal that, no matter what it is, to anyone else for any reason, unless the penitent gives him permission. Now, uh, think about the alternative to that. Think about the church said, well, you know, y- you have to keep it a secret. Well, unless it's just a really bad sin. And then you don't have to keep it a secret. Well, wh- what's going to happen if the church says that? Well, a couple things are going to happen. First of all, um, priests all over the world are going to be pressed uh, politically into giving testimony. Yeah. Um, and and uh, and that has happened. That has happened lots. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, even when they know that this is a seal of the confessional, but at least now priests can can plead the seal of the confessional. Um, if uh, if they had the option of revealing stuff when under duress, like, say, when the government pressed upon them, lots of them would probably cave if they didn't have the seal to... The reason you take a vow is to strengthen you in time of adversity. Sure. Right? The reason I vow fidelity to my wife is so that I'll be faithful to my wife. Right? The reason a priest vows fidelity to the confessional is so he'll be faithful to the confessional. If he doesn't have that option, when pressure comes, he's going to cave then suddenly the confessional becomes not a private forum and nobody goes. Yeah. Jeff, we hope that's helpful for you and for your wife. Thanks so much uh, for contacting the show. In a moment, we'll talk to Caitlin in New Jersey, Stephen Waukegan, Moses in Phoenix, Nancy in Seattle, Joe in Anchorage. Woo! Busy day on Call to Communion. In confusion and uncertainty, there emerges a guiding light. Every single one of us, we're weak. Uh, You know, all of us are sinners in need of God's mercy. Yet despite that, God can still use us for his glory. A beacon that cuts through the darkness. Our weaknesses can't be excuses for God not doing his will. I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and I invite you to join me for Beacon of Truth. Today at 4 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Here's another EWTN Real News Minute. The year 303 AD. It is the time of Emperor Diocletian's brutal persecution of Christians. Bishop Januarius of Benevento secretly visits imprisoned believers to console and strengthen them. However, Januarius is soon discovered and brought to the Roman governor, who demands that he renounce his faith in Jesus Christ. Januarius refuses. The governor orders the beheading of the bishop and his companions. Eusebia, a Christian woman, gathers some of Januarius' blood into two vials, which are soon buried with his body in the cathedral in Naples. Three times a year, when this martyr's blood is placed close to his head on the high altar, it liquefies and turns red. The miracle of St. Januarius was first witnessed in 1389 and continues to this day. Amazon Echo is a smart speaker that allows you to use just your voice. You can listen to EWTN Radio just by saying, Alexa, play EWTN Radio. Check out the Amazon Echo today. Matt Swaim here. Join Anna Mitchell and me on the Sunrise Morning Show as we give you the latest news, weather, sports, and everything you need to bring your Catholic faith into your everyday life. Now back to Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. It's called a communion on this Thursday afternoon, a big day, big Thursday, holy Thursday here on EWTN. Our phone number 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Hey, our friends in central and northern Illinois, well, they need to hear from you next week. Catholic Spirit Radio, a longtime affiliate of EWTN, airing their Carathon starting on Tuesday. So if you're listening in Bloomington or Normal or Lincoln, Illinois, or anywhere, remember to support your EWTN Catholic radio station. This is uh, traditionally for Catholic stations. It's a spring thing and a fall thing. Sometimes uh, they'll do four a year, three a year. The important thing is to support your local Catholic radio station so they can stay on the air, pay the bills, you know, keep the wolf from the door and all that so that uh, we can continue to spread the good news to everybody. Let's go now to uh, Caitlin in Vernon, New Jersey, watching us on YouTube this afternoon. Hey there, Caitlin. A blessed Holy Week to you. What's on your mind today? Happy Holy Week. Thanks for taking my call. Sure, sure. 
I, um, I'm calling um, on behalf of my brother, who is a young adult. He's 24 years old, um, going through a difficult work situation, um, and has recently um, been growing in his faith and wants to consider a devotion to, not a devotion, a discernment to the priesthood. Um, one big hitch, he is engaged, and he is bringing his um, his a fiance, she's coming into the Catholic Church this Easter vigil. They are scheduled to be married in November. And I, I don't know what he might be going through or feeling, but I was hoping that you might be able to speak to him as um, seeing marriage through the Catholic lens of vocation and how it's also a, a great place of, of holiness, a place to grow in holiness. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and I really appreciate the privilege of speaking to such an important issue. Thank you for asking me. So, uh, yes, the Catholic position is, first of all, let's get clear on what we mean by vocation. That's that's really important, I think, to have that in our head. Vocation, the, the word comes from the Latin word that means call. Some people have in mind the idea that, you know, vocation means that you're you're like the, the, the young boy, Prophet Samuel. You're lying in bed one night, and you hear a voice come through the dark, and it says, Samuel, Samuel, and it's God, and he's got some great work for you to do. And on that model, you know, they think, well, you know, marriage isn't that. Marriage is guy meets girl. It's Romeo and Juliet. You know, it's the oldest story on earth, but it's not a voice from heaven speaking to me. Not priesthood. Ha ha, that's different. You know, if I feel some inclination to the priesthood, well, that means that I've I've heard the voice from heaven. That's vocation and with a capital V, big sense of the term. That's really a bad understanding of the notion of vocation. It's not what the church means by vocation at all. A vocation isn't some secret whispering in the depths of your soul that you identify with the Holy Spirit. Vocation is a settled form of life, an institution of public life. Uh, by an institution, I mean it's a it's a particular form of life that that uh, that transcends you historically, right? It it was in existence uh, in society before you. It will be in existence after you. It's a form of life that you choose to step into. You can assume that form of life, and you do so. That it's a form of life that's ordered toward some good of the common life, some common good, not to some personal private good. Like you know, some people might talk, think about well, you know. My vocation is to, uh, you know, is to be a musician because I really love music. And what they have in mind by that is, well, it's something that gives me a lot of fulfillment. Again, that's not the idea. A vocation in the Catholic sense is a form of life that is ordered toward the common good of the people of God. All right? That's essential. Now, one form of life that's ordered to the good of the people of God is the form of life called priesthood, where uh, where a man enters that form of life that enables him to celebrate the sacraments, which are essential to the body of Christ. You've got to have sacraments to have the, 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 the visible life of the Catholic Church. And so you don't have a priest who can celebrate sacraments, you can't have a Catholic community. There is There are other forms of, of or life that are ordered to the common good of the people of God. One of them is religious life. Now, the essence of religious life is not the celebration of the sacraments. That's not the essence of religious life. The essence of religious life is to live the evangelical counsels, poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's the essence. Why is that a good for the people of God? Well, because when you see the life of Catholic religious, everyone else in the church is encouraged to live their own vocation to holiness. You know, the husband who is tempted to infidelity against his wife, for example, in marriage, looks and goes, well, like, I'm married and I'm tempted to infidelity, but, but you know, Father Joe over here, like, He's one step further down. I mean, he's celibate. You know, he's given himself entirely to the life of chastity. If he can do that within the context of religious life, it ought to be fairly easy for me to do it within the context of marriage. Same thing, like, you know, here's Joe again, and he's got a good-paying job, and he's wondering, how much of this can I get to keep? And he looks over at, at uh, you know, at, at Brother Sam, and Brother Sam, like, he has the habit on his back, and that's his only possessions, right? So living the religious life in public is for the benefit of the whole body of Christ, not just for the good of the religious himself. Now, here's another ordered form of life that's for the good of the people of God, marriage. What is the public good that marriage serves? Well, I was giving a retreat one time years ago to a group of priests, and I was encouraging them. I said, you know, priests, you guys preach Catholic doctrine, Preach Catholic doctrine. It's, I mean, what I meant by that is like, like get theology out there, like put the dogmas of the faith out there in front of the people. And there was this, uh, there was this priest, and he was, I think he was from, uh, 
he was from West Africa somehow, and he had a, you know, had a beautiful accent. And he jumps up and he goes, yes, yes, I'm always telling my people this. Have babies. Where do you think priests come from? They do not, <laughs> they do not grow on mango trees. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that was right, right? So sure. his point, you're not going to have priests if you don't have Catholic families to make them, right? They don't right. grow on mango trees, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and uh, so one of the goods of marriage to the life of the church is to replenish is to replenish the people of God biologically. You got to have new Catholics to have a Catholic church, and we're not, you know, we're not doing it just by converts. Right. right? We're not, we're not shakers who all live the celibate life. You, you make Catholics in part by giving birth to them, or at least, and then baptizing them. Sure, right? sure. And then raising them up in the first society of every Catholic, which is the domestic church. Now, it is very much a church. It is a church in a very real sense. This is not merely a metaphor. And by the way, the concept of a domestic church, it's not a John Paul II invention. This is, this is an image that both Augustine and Chrysostom used. Fathers of the church spoke about the life of the family as a little church or a mm. domestic church. Uh, they're in the Book of Blessings, almost all of which are reserved to priests. There is a specific blessing that is reserved for parents of their children, and underscoring, I think, the sort of quasi-priestly character of parenthood, that is to say they mediate God, yeah. uh, to their very own children. And within that community of the family, uh, that is the first school of Christ for most people, right? They come to know the Lord and the life of the sacraments in the context of the family, from which they are then able to go out into the world and bear witness for Christ in, in the world, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so the church does consider that to be very much an essential vocation, without which, you do, just, just like you don't have a Catholic church without the life of the sacraments, you don't have a Catholic church without families, which is why, which is why the central image of sanctity uh, at, a, at, a, at a kind of social level in Scripture is the Holy Family, you know, I, I, I'm not a person who's much given to, you know, dreams and visions and revelations. That's not my lot in life. But I remember one time years ago I was praying after, shortly after I'd become Catholic, and I was thinking, you know, I, I really need some inspiration here to, to find a model of holiness in my own life. You know, like, is there some saint that could be for me like the go-to guy you know, that I sort of base my life on? And I went to prayer with that image in mind. You know, who is the, who's the guy, Lord? Let me know. And then as soon as I sat down to pray, the thought came to me, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> it would be the Holy Family. I was in family life at the time, you know, sure. and I still am. And I was like, well, oh, yeah, there's the Holy Family. Kind of patently obvious there, yes. you know. Yes. Um, and uh, as a model of sanctity for, for priests and lay persons alike. Right? Sure. Um, uh, of course, marriage is not just a vocation. It is also a sacrament. And that is a dogma of the faith, and if any priest that denies it is a heretic, right? Um, and as a sacrament, it means that it is a means of grace, that it's a that is a sign of Christ's union with the church, that is accompanied by this supernatural infusion of supernatural grace, sanctifying grace, that brings us to sanctity. And uh, and the the Second Vatican Council in the Pastoral Constitution Gaudium et Spes, writing on marriage, beautiful beautiful passage on matrimony in Gaudium et Spes talks about marriage being the sphere for the, the for the mutual perfection of the personality right and, and it really is that it really is that it really is a situation of great uh, opportunity to grow in sanctity and the language that the council uses is mystical it really is the, the sort of thing that a mystic wants to uh, accomplish in contemplative prayer is ascribed to the life of the family now let, let's talk about personal holiness here okay of course a man can come to personal holiness through the life of the priesthood. Of course he can. And it's really easy for him not to. It's really easy for priests not to come to holiness. And, and here's how. I mean, th this is, it's so much a possibility that St. John Vianney, who is the patron saint of all priests, despaired of his possibility to, of, of going to heaven if he remained a parish priest. Now, that was paranoid on his part. It was, it was scrupulous on his part. But he kept trying to run away and join a monastery because he was so afraid he wouldn't make it to heaven as a parish <laughs> priest, right? Because he knew so many that weren't holy. That's yeah, the point, right? Yeah. He knew so many that weren't holy. And uh, <clears throat> I, I know priests who live their vocation with just incredible self-sacrifice and dedication. Unfortunately, I've also seen some that regard it as a job that requires them to work one day a week when they get to play a lot of golf, mm, right? Yeah. And it's possible to live the vocation of priesthood um, as a kind of sinecure, 
where I get to be, you know, in my own little fiefdom, boss of everything and, you know, answer to nobody, and uh, uh, including my bishop. And, you know, I have to go say some prayers on Sunday, and then after that I get to kind of do whatever I want. I have met priests that take that kind of lackadaisical attitude towards priesthood, and that's not going to be for them a means of sanctity, right? Yeah. And um, by contrast, family life, I mean, if you are seriously committed to the project, I mean, I don't have to tell you if you're a parent, it's a life of incredible self-sacrifice. I mean, uh, you, I have a buddy that, that used to sell guitars at Guitar Center, and he said, you know, you know who like our most common client is? He says, I said, who's that? He says, you know, it's the 50-year-old guy who played guitar when he was in his teens and 20s. <laughs> then he had to stop for 30 years while he raised a family. And now he can get back to it again, and yeah. he goes back in his fifties and his sixties, and he and he takes up his his uh, his his youthful passion. He had to put his own interests on hold for thirty years. Sure, right? that's what married life is like. That's the laying down of one's life. That is the taking up of the cross that Christ calls us to. That is the essence of sanctity. And yeah. um yeah. and and. By the way, didn't your wife buy you music lessons recently? Yes, <laughs> yes, she did. It was a Christmas gift. I get uh, three lessons on the instrument of my choice, so I'm going to go back and get some drum yeah. lessons. You know, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm in my 50s now, and I, I, uh, I, I have two guitars at home, one that I bought when I was 16, Uh huh. one that I bought when I was in my 50s. Wow. So I'm following the pattern here. Caitlin, thanks so much for your call. It's a call to communion here on EWTN. We're going to try to get through all these calls. I know that some of them are Holy Week, Easter related. We'll do our very best to get through all these. A couple of quick things here, David, from uh, YouTube. Kevin says, I thought the priest can't break the seal of confession even if the penitent gives permission. Is that correct? Oh, no, no. He, if the penitent gives permission. So here is a common, well, it's not common, but here's one of the few occasions when that can happen. And I know of this as a specific instance. Uh-huh. So um, I, I know of a case where a woman falsely accused a priest of solicitation in the confessional, which is a canonical crime which would result in his excommunication, right? The priest was innocent, but this woman was bitter and vindictive, and she wanted to zap this guy, so she went out and made an accusation that he had solicited her in the confessional, and it was false. It was a false accusation. So yeah. the priest suffered for decades. Of course, he can't defend himself, because he's not allowed to reveal anything from the confessional, right? So he suffers. He's, his name has been dragged through the mud. He's terrible. Then she is making her deathbed confession. Uh-huh. And uh, she tells the priest on her deathbed, you know, I, I slandered this other priest and ruined his life out of, out, of, uh, you know, out of vindictiveness, and I'm profoundly sorry. And so the priest absolves her and then says, before you die, <laughs> would you please give me the permission to go share this with the bishop? so that I can have this guy rehabilitated, yeah. and she gave permission. And so that this the only reason we know the story, wow. right? Wow. The only reason we know the story. Sure. So you can, a, pre, a, a penitent can give permission, but uh, but uh, but that's the only situation, like okay. when they give permission. All right, and one other quick one here from uh, Father Bill watching on YouTube. He says, since Dr. Andrews already answered the question regarding confessional, what I tell people about the seal of confession is that to break the seal is to steal God's mercy from him. Oh, that's exactly right. Isn't that's that beautiful. Exactly, because you would experience it, rightly so, as a profound betrayal. Yeah. yeah. As a profound betrayal. Very and, good. And, uh, you know, Pope Francis has some wonderful writing about the attitude that priests should take towards penitent in the confessional. And I can't get the quotes exactly right. But mm-hmm. basically, you're holding someone's heart in your hand. Sure. You know, it is a very delicate moment in that person's life. And the idea is that it is an occasion for a change of life. Yeah. So, you know, you think about, take that issue of the pedophile or the serial killer or the abuser, right? They have to make a purpose of amendment. Now, do you want to remove from the worst people the opportunity to actually make a change in their life? Sure. No, you don't. Father Bill, thanks for checking in on YouTube today. Uh, Coming up this uh, evening on EWTN Radio, the Solemn Mass of the Lord's Supper. We're going to bring that to you live from the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. That's tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. We've got such a lineup for you. For a complete list of EWTN's Holy Week and Easter programming, go to EWTN.com slash radio and then click on Schedule. You'll see a red box that says Holy Week and Easter. It's all there for you. Here is Joe now, a first-time caller in Anchorage, Alaska, listening on uh, Holy Rosary Academy. Hey there, Joe. What's on your mind today, sir? Hi there. Um, 
I kind of nervous. Sorry. Um, I'm calling about a month ago. I stumbled across EWTN, and that kind of kick-started my uh, religious journey. One of the things I've struggled with, though, is I, I'm gay in a relationship with another man, have been for five years or so. He's a non-denominational Christian. I struggle with the Catholic teaching on that and how to kind of rectify that and how to go about it. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I really appreciate the question profoundly, and I really appreciate you, Joe. I really do, and I thank you for listening and calling and, and, and trusting this question to us. I mean, that's a lot of trust on your part, and so I really appreciate you. Thank you, and I want to be as helpful to you as I possibly can. Um, let me say at the outset that uh, I'm not a gay man. I'm a straight man. I also struggle to reconcile the Catholic teaching on sexuality in my own life as a straight married man. I don't find it easy to live. Um, I don't find the marriage life easy to live. Uh, I find it quite difficult, in fact. And when when Christ explained his teaching on human sexuality to the apostles, some of them scoffed, his very own disciples, and they said, well, then it would seem like it's better for a man not to marry like than to put up with what you're talking about. And And Jesus' response to that was not to say, don't be ridiculous. He was like, well, to some this is given, and to some it isn't. And, you know, but, but what is impossible for man is possible with God, right? So there's, there's no doubt that the teaching on sexuality is a challenging one. I find it challenging, right? Um, and so I'm really, you know, I'm sensitive. Um, the, uh, another thing I would say is that, as I'm sure you're aware, from the Church's point of view, to have a deep-seated and even exclusive homoerotic inclination is a morally neutral thing, right? That, that what the inclination. Is the inclination, right? That what's morally relevant are our activities, our actions. What we choose to do with those impulses is where the question of morality comes from, not the inclination themselves. Um, I have gay Catholic friends who, um, who came into the church from situations very much like your own, who, uh, who just decided to live celibate, um, but in other respects, you know, like they didn't marry, they didn't try to be something other than who they felt they were, they didn't try to take on burdens that they knew were impossible for them to carry, um, but with the grace of God, they seek to live chaste lives, right? Um, and so you're not alone in this, and of course, you know, there are groups of Catholics that are committed to supporting one another in the difficulty of the life of chastity, particularly, you know, for those who suffer from uh, these deep-seated inclinations, like the, the ministry Courage, for example, would be one uh, of people who, very much like yourself, who are interested in the Catholic faith, but find the, 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 the teaching on, um, on, uh, on, on celibacy and, and heterosexual normativity to be challenging, and so they support one another in these fellowships. And, you know, the 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 thing about the, the essence of the Catholic teaching on sexuality is that at the end of the day, our sexuality is a gift given to us by God for the procreation of children, for the creation of an institution called a family, right? And so for a straight man, that means that he has to moderate all his other sexual impulses yeah. uh, in the interests of, uh, you know, the, the best interest of that child and that institution called the family. And, um, and that's 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 challenging right and if a person for whatever reason says well you know fatherhood in that way is is not for me right then they have to find other ways in life of both of cultivating cultivating intimacy and also of seeking you know a kind of spiritual fatherhood i mean the priest for example um i have a I have a priest friend who said when he was discerning his vocation to the priesthood he he said you know he told a spiritual director i'd really like to be a priest but i'd also really like to be a father and the priest's answer to him his spiritual director answered him and said well can you imagine a good priest that didn't want to be a father right you have to find other other models of fatherhood right right, right. and uh no one said it was easy right it's not right. easy and uh and 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 look you know we make a purpose of amendment to say I've done wrong in the past. I want to change my life and live a different style of life, um, and uh, and I'm and I'm committed to to that effort. But we understand that people are weak and people fall, and that's why the confessional is there, right? You you, you get up, you try again. Yep. You know, you maybe fall off. You, you get up, you try again, and 
you know, for some of us, that 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 battle uh, continues for our whole lives. Other people have an extraordinary grace, and they say that St. Thomas Aquinas prayed for the gift of chastity, and it was given to him, and he never had a temptation against chastity ever since. That was not my experience. You know, it's not most people's experience, <laughs> sure. but you never know. Joe, God bless you, sir. Thank you so much for your call. Appreciate that. Moses is listening in Phoenix on Sirius XM Channel 130. Moses, what's on your mind tonight, today? <laughs> yes. Hi, Dr. David Anders. Um, the self-imposed fasting, Lent season, right? Does that, I know it's self-imposed, right? And I know we create our own, what are we giving up or what are we adding, right? When does that, I mean, other than it being self-imposed, when does that technically end? Because I was always under the impression growing up, cradle Catholic, that it ends on Easter Sunday, and that's when we celebrate, that's when we feast, that's when we go wild, right? However, I've been told recently or read recently somewhere that, that it actually ends tonight on Holy Thursday after the Last Supper meal. I mean, we still have a regular so, fast on Friday. Yeah, so of course the liturgical fasts imposed by the Church are, are, um, are Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. And so those, those are written in stone, uh, as it were. Uh, the uh, you know the question of if I'm giving up chocolate or something like that that is a little bit more personal. The common practice, I believe, and this again, this is not a liturgical law; it's just sort of the practice of the church. Is uh, yeah, the party starts after Easter vigil. So after you go to Easter, Easter vigil. vigil mass, you know, and if you, you get out at nine, ten, eleven, twelve o'clock at night, that's what that's when you break out the you know the Hershey's kisses or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Moses, thanks for your call. Nancy is in Seattle listening on YouTube. Nancy, we just have a few moments here. What's on your mind? Oh, hi, Dr. Anders and Tom Price. I was just going to ask Dr. Anders um, what his uh, happiest memories were on Easter and um, if he learned anything brand new that he would cherish uh, after his uh, Protestant uh, conversion to Catholicism. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So growing up as a Protestant, the way I understood Christ's death and resurrection was such that I saw the point of the death but not of the resurrection. Because the whole point of the, of the death of Christ in my mind as a Protestant uh -huh. was that the only reason he died was to uh, be punished by God for my sins vicariously so that I could be forgiven. And so the rest of Jesus' life seemed almost irrelevant. Like the teaching of Christ— was kind of interesting, but it really didn't have anything to do, so to speak, with this death of atonement. And the resurrection was like, well, you know, I guess God vindicates him or something, but really it didn't have anything to do with my salvation, right? The issue was just what happened on the cross on, on, uh, on Good Friday. And when I became Catholic or began to explore the Catholic faith, I, I realized that that was an entirely wrong way of thinking about the death of Christ. And it was, in fact, all of Jesus' life from his conception to his ascension into heaven that were implicated in my salvation, because the patristic understanding of Christ was that he entered into solidarity with the human race so that he could heal in its entirety what had been deformed through the sin of Adam. Irenaeus said that we regain in Christ what we lost in Adam, namely to be in the likeness and image of God. And so all of Christ's life is a kind of pattern for me to follow, but more than that, it's kind of divine reality with which I can become mystically united in baptism through faith, so that, the say, the pattern of Christ's temptation in the desert, the pattern of Christ's discipleship, the pattern of Christ's teaching, the pattern of his ethical life, all those things come to be imprinted upon my character by my identity with him. And, of course, his resurrection is the pattern of victory of sin that also becomes imprinted upon my personality through the activity of the Holy Spirit. So Easter really is a tremendous event in, um, in the salvation of the world. It's, it's not just a kind of uh, flag waving by God to, you know, to say, you know, goal. Right? It's, <laughs> it really is a, a, a sort of eschatological, soteriological event where my whole person is transformed. Nancy, thanks so much for your call. Uh, Luke in Nebraska, we couldn't get to you. However, uh, the question that you're asking uh, regarding the Triduum is answered on the beginning of today's program. So you could check out the podcast by going to EWTN.com slash radio. Look for the words Podcast Central. Dr. David Anders, have a blessed Christmas. Thanks, Dr. Tom. Did you hear what I just said? I, well, I'm going to have one of those, too. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Later. Right now, have a blessed Easter. Thank you. We'll see you next time right here on EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. I'm Tom Price. We'll see you then. Have a blessed Easter. God bless. 
The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I'm continually amazed and humbled at the way God can work through me to help so many people. Although I have no idea what the caller's questions will be that day, I trust that the Holy Spirit can use my education and experience to guide, challenge, or comfort those who call. Master Peel with Colleen Kelly.